Coastal Community Church, greetings. We miss your face, but we trust that you are flourishing while you shelter in. I know there's an itchiness to get on the way, get, get back to normal. We need to realize, though, there are some people that are still deathly afraid of this thing and that will not exit their homes until they get the all clear, if that ever actually comes. So we don't want to be a divided church. We want to pray for one another, make sure we are checking in with one another and doing what we can to strengthen ourselves, finish up the chores that we've been procrastinating on, and uh, just have a uh, hopeful anticipation of the day when we will get back together with your new pastor, who should be here around the middle of June. What a joy. So uh, let me pray for you. I think that's all I have in the way of announcements. But uh, let's begin on this Mother's Day, 2020. Father in heaven, we give you all the praise and thanksgiving for your wonderful care for us. And we know that each one of us is here through the exceptional role of womanhood and motherhood. And none of us would be here were it not for mothers. And so we are especially mindful of ours, whoever she may be. And we trust, Lord, that in a special way today, she will feel blessed and honored, if not by your children, at least by you. And for those who have, for those women who have never been a mother, they still have a mother who they can be grateful for and thank and praise and honor. So as we turn to the Word of God, Lord, 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 we are looking for inspiration, not just to strengthen us, but to accomplish that which pleases you, so that this time is not wasted in your midst. So we invite your Holy Spirit to join us here, open our eyes, our hearts, and our ears, so that we may contemplate what it is that you wanted us to glean, glean from the Word today. These things we ask in anticipation, in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Today's lesson will be uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 6 through 13. And it, the title of it will be A Memorable Woman, with three points. Studious, she was studious, she was sorrowful, she was a servant. So let me read the passage first in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 13. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for my burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It's amazing that by speaking about her today, we know without a doubt that we're doing something that God told us to do. Jesus told us to memorialize her, and so we seize this day to do so. Although we, we did not account of the name of the woman who did this anointing of Jesus in this passage that we read, we read in John's version of it, in chapter 12, that we know the name of this humble woman was Mary of Bethany. There are, as when you go to preacher school, they and you go to homiletics on how to preach. 
They say that there's four ways to preach the Bible. It could be expository, which is verse by verse. And since there are over 31,000 verses in the Bible, we have a resource of material that's unquestioned. Un it could be a doctrinal sermon. Uh, there are six doctrines in the scriptures that our theologians have classified the scripture in, such as ecclesiology about the church, theology, Christology, soteriology, which is the salvation, and es eschatology, which most people are so interested in, end times. Then it could be a topical Bible, like we had last week when we talked about the Lord's table. But today's sermon will be the fourth example of the way to preach, and that is a character study, such as talking about Abraham, or David, or Jonathan, or Peter, or Paul, making a, an example of them for us to follow. But this character study is all about Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, perhaps the, the, the daughter of Simon the leper. Uh, the main reason Mary should be one of these characters for such a sermon is because Jesus said, as we read, truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So what was the significance of this activity and, and what kind of person was she? So we have Mary the studious one as, as recorded in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 through 42. As it reads like this. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So here we see Mary of Bethany, spellbound, studious, sitting at Jesus' feet and listening so intently that she doesn't even notice that her, her sister Martha was busy preparing a meal, probably in and out, trying to catch a few words, but then preparing a meal. She's preparing a meal for the guest who she had just invited into her home. When Martha suggested to Jesus that he might excuse his, her sister so that she could help prepare a meal, Jesus probably in his usual patient and polite demeanor said, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the good portion. My 94-year-old mother, Marie, does not like Jesus' response to Martha in that case. <laughs> See, my mother, she married within a couple of weeks after she turned 21, and nine months later, she had her first of six children. That happened to me. She, but I know that my mother was probably one of the most devoted, devout women that ever walked the face of the earth. She kept a very regimented house, very tidy, very well functioning, but she loved the Lord and she prayed often. I'm proud of my mother. I, I'm eager to honor her today, this 73rd Mother's Day. But I tell my mom, I said, Mom, Martha is also valued by Jesus because he said in John chapter 11, verse 5, uh, when he was preparing to tell us another story in chapter 11, he says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So actually Mary went unmentioned, but it specifically says, and now Jesus loved Martha. So take the light, Mom. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, he was um, regularly ministered to by this family as he was anywhere near Jerusalem. But Mary 
of Bethany was the studious one, clinging to every word of the teacher. So, that was Mary the studious one. What about Mary the sorrowful one? Well, the next time we see Mary of Bethany, it's in John chapter 11. Lazarus, her brother, had died four days earlier. And Jesus purposely dis delayed uh, his arrival in spite of the family asking him to come to his aid. Well, hearing that Jesus was nearby, Martha left home and met him somewhere along the way. But Mary of Bethany, she was so stricken with grief over the loss of her brother, brother that she, she either didn't hear the news that Jesus had arrived or maybe she just refused to acknowledge him in an act of defiance because of her grief. Uh, one thing we know about grief, grief is likely the deepest and the most raw expression of love. You think about it. When you're finally confronted with the fact that you will never see the face, touch the hand, hear the voice, or experience the presence of somebody that had meant so much to you in your life, and you're suddenly confronted with a loss, you feel deeply an agony that cannot be described, cannot be matched, and therein is a manifestation of our love for that person. Women, I, th I, th women, I think, uh, are so much more vulnerable to deep hurts. They hurt very deeply. And especially in their connection to their children. It's so much more so than the umbilical cord. Mothers invest their lifeblood in their children for their entire life. Uh, when the scripture says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's no greater demonstration of that truth than in motherhood. Children may be the crown of their father, but they are the treasure of a mother and her heart. The Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10 says very wisely, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. A woman's heart is sort of on her sleeve, so to speak, and is easily wounded. And I know a lot of women that have carried uh, a grief for a wayward child all the way to her death. If we were to look up the definition of compassion in the dictionary, we'd probably see a picture of a woman. But when the grieving Mary of Bethany heard that Jesus had requested her, she ran to him with haste, and she threw herself at his feet in total despair, saying, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There is no better person to cling to in such a time as that, for he is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, but, but seeing all this grief brought even Jesus to tears, and perhaps now he was more likely determined than ever to go to the cross so they could rid the world of this grief and this fear of death and this sorrow. What he did afterwards, raising Lazarus from the dead, uh, was evidence that he could certainly do that. Exactly what he promised. But would that all change if he himself died at the hands of him who had the keys of death? Could, his, could the promises of Jesus actually be thwarted? Mary of Bethany, she was the sorrowful one. That was part of her nature. She took grief to the feet of Jesus, and he shared it as his own. Well, in this next scene, spoken by the three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, for which Mary is, for, where it says Mary is forever to be remembered, it was now six days before the Passover, and Jesus was dining again 
and the same house where Martha was serving again, as stated in John chapter 12, and Mary of Bethany again was at his feet, wiping them with her hair and anointing them with an expensive uh, ointment. And you notice in John it said feet, whereas in Matthew it said head. And I know that some people may be conflicted by these, these differences in the scripture written writings, but for me, I conclude very easily that, well, she probably did both, both the head and the feet. But one thing is mindful, we should be mindful of. In all three passages, Jesus says, Jesus was mindful that he was, she was preparing him for his burial. So, so here's where I speculate with a sort of a sanctified imagination. I venture into the possibility why this anointing of the feet had such a significance that resulted in Jesus saying, make a memorial for her. Just because Jesus said to do it, that's good enough. But we know that we know that in the Garden of Eden, Eve fell victim to the deceptive wooing on the part of that beguiling serpent. She ate the forbidden fruit, and then she gave it to Adam, encouraging him to do the same. And the results we know now were devastating for the whole creation. And as God pronounced his foretelling that someday the seed of the woman will pound the head, that's the way the rabbis interpret, translate that phrase, not bruise the head, or not crush the head, but pound the head of the seed of the serpent, while the heel of her seed would be bruised in that final fray. I think she and all women afterwards held firmly to that promise of avenging her and reversing the results of her fatal mistake. So if there's any truth to that, then I sense that Mary of Bethany recognized a destiny to anoint the very heel that would soon be accomplishing that bruising task. Oh, for certain. She seized every opportunity to saturate herself with uh, the teachings of this amazing prophet. Unlike Jesus' disciples, she clung to every word. She heard him foretell of his death and his resurrection. She expected him to follow through on it all. Yet in one of the most agonizing moments of her life, she fled to him totally empty-handed, empty-hearted, and fell at his feet. And to the amazement of everyone, she received her brother, Lazarus, back from the dead. But when it came time for the Savior of the world to be anointed for his priestly task and his final intercessory confrontation with evil, she, Mary of Bethany, stepped into the role on our behalf. It was for this purpose that Jesus wanted her to be memorialized. So, what do we take away from this character study? Do we take away doctrine of any kind? Well, if you understand Paul's use of the word doctrine, you realize that yes, we did, because Paul's use of the word doctrine in Timothy and Timothy's epistle was it's the stories, it's the stories that the Bible contains. Was it expository in any way? Well, did we allow the scripture to tell us a story or did we force anything into it? You decide. Did we allow the scripture? Well, this, this topic is not a t just a topic of motherhood or womanhood. We all need to embrace, embrace the uh, unique value of this woman and the greater example that she portrays as the church in relation to the head, our Savior. We should always seek 
a, the heavenly uh, perspective in all scripture. Yes, it is important to feed the physical body as Martha was doing. The nurture of the spiritual body is much more essential from the perspective of heaven. Caring for the temporal and the spiritual needs of the body of Christ, the church, is likewise essential. The building, the people, the spiritual nurturing. The loss of someone well, very special is debilitating. Grief, for any reason, should never be wasted. The contrite heart, especially when it has to do with sin, is what moved Jesus. You know, Jesus intended to raise Nazareth, uh, to, to raise Lazarus, even before he got to Bethan, uh, to Bethany. But Mary had his heart. And Jesus had her heart. He felt her grief, her broken sp spirit, and her contrite heart. He wept. And then he worked a miracle beyond what anyone could have asked or imagined. You know, in Romans chapter 8, we read a lot about prayer and the Holy Spirit there. Romans 8, 26, we read that the Spirit helps elevate our prayers. It says, He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. In verse 22 of chapter 8, it says, All creation is groaning under the strain of the sin, and they're waiting for man to be redeemed. And then it says in verse 23, And we are groaning for our redemption. Whether you know it or not, the misery that mankind is experiencing is all for the purpose of why are we in this situation we are in? Can I be delivered from this at some time? We are groaning. And verse 26 said, the Spirit groans for us as we elevate our prayers. It says the Spirit helps our weaknesses. That word help is the same word help that Martha used when she said, can't you tell my sister to help me? Those, that word is only used twice in the New Testament by Martha and by the Holy Spirit in those situations. What's your record of answered prayer? I know the answered prayers that I cherish most are the, uh, the ones that were the heaviest burdens and were and the ones that especially took, I had to take to the throne of heaven for years. I wanted to tell you about a couple of those stories if we had the time in the future. Well, just as we shared last week that the Lord's table was to be, among other things, a memorial, Mary of Bethany's anointing of Jesus' feet was to be spoken of as her memorial. She anointed him as her priest as her curse breaker, as her covenant maker, as her oath keeper. All those titles we know Jesus to be on our behalf. So in like character, we are supposed to anoint Jesus daily as our priest, sanctioning him in our hearts to appear on our behalf at the throne of heaven, the Father, not to condemn, but to intercede for us. He says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. He, he went all in. Jesus went all in for us. He is still there interceding for us. He took on this human form to reconcile us to God, and he is not dead. The promises are still yea and amen. He has risen, and he sits at the right hand of God to make intercession. So we should sit at his feet, be saturated with his words, and abide in his love, and let him carry your cares and your griefs. And also remember, he inhabits your praises. Nothing makes you feel the presence of God like praising him. He holds you likewise in his heart. Your sins are forgiven. 
He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We too are to be living monuments to the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. Living tombstones, as the scripture says in Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Be a living monument to the sacrificial death of your Savior, for he cares for you. You too are a memorial, but we did what Jesus told us to do today. We spoke about this woman, Mary of Bethany, in memorial to what she had done as an example for us. So go in peace and rejoice and celebrate Mom today. Let me pray. Father, we are grateful for the examples of such situations that you have preserved for us. We know that Mary's name does not appear in Hebrews chapter 11, where all those heroes of the faith are listed. Instead, she has an exclusive spot from the lips of Jesus as it was recorded in the Gospels. And for that reason, Lord, we look at her intently and try to find what it is that you would like us to know about her, what would you like us to know about you, and what would you like us to do as a result. And we have found some guidance, so we ask that you would seal it in our hearts by your Spirit and help us to apply ourselves to the Word of God, to realize that any cares that we have are to be brought to you, and that indeed you did come to perish, to die, but then again to raise from the dead for the purpose of sealing us eternally forever and for heaven and delivering us someday into your presence. So we will be transformed and we look forward to that day. We look forward to many days, some in the very near future and some perhaps distant. But nonetheless, we have a vision looking forward to you as the author of our faith. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy the day, honor mom, and God bless you all.